like what an ERP is doing, it's they're trying to do everything at once and optimizing the whole workflow, which like makes it cumbersome. And you know, you're just gonna, uh, it just leads to failure after that. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Applied Tech series. Uptech Report is sponsored by TerraLeap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at TerraLeap.io. Today, I am joined by my guest, Arjun Patel, who's based in LA. He's the co-founder and CEO at WorkClout. Welcome, Arjun. Good to have you on. I get to have good to be on. Um, I'm excited to be here and excited to you know share a little bit about my story and hopefully inspire others to take the same journey on. Now, yeah, starting a, a tech startup is not a small thing. Now, what you guys are focused on at WorkCloud is quality and safety management, specifically in the manufacturing mm-hmm. industrial industries. O- on your website, it says, mistake-proof your quality process. Mm-hmm. Help me understand, Arjun, like, where, where did this start for you? I've, in our prep chat, already, I feel like you said it was actually with your, your dad who was are in, in industrial and manufacturing. You saw some of the problems. Like, how did that lead to you starting uh, WorkCloud? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, yeah. Thanks for asking that question. Uh, this this really began when uh, I, I I'll, I'll, like my like to give you a little bit of background. My my father he started he he immigrated to the U.S. in 1985, and then he started a manufacturing company. He was owning like a bunch of uh, other stuff, like he owned a car wash, owned a liquor store, and eventually, you know, um, he started uh, working on a manufacturing company. And um, it, it took him like two to three years to get into it, but he started that in like 1995 and. Um, the companies started taking off around like 1997, uh, and and now it's like a 500 person operation. And um, throughout the years, you know, were you involved well, in it like early on? Yeah, um, early on, I, I was a baby. I was like a little kid when I, early yes. on, but <laughs> but as it yeah, grew, but, um, you were part of it. Yeah, yeah. As it grew, I was I was very much like a part of it. You know, um, most of my friends they'd be hanging out, biking after school. I would be. Uh, you know, in the factory, uh, like racing on, you know, uh, the, the, the forklifts. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, safe. you know, I, I learned about later, yeah, not, not, not really safe, but, um, uh, for the most part, you know, I, I, like I was, uh, I was very much in that environment. So it was a lot easier for me to pick up problems within the environment, you know, and I know it was like, as I got older, I, I realized, you know, this was a very specific, like the problems I was seeing was very specific to my dad's manufacturing, or that's what I thought initially. And, um, and I got into consulting right after college because I, I worked at my dad's factory uh, when I was in college, I was like a plant manager and I focused a lot on the quality optimization, safety optimization, um, and even like production efficiency optimizations. And, uh, you know, we really, really never adopted software or any type of technology. Everything was manual. Like there's huge binders tracking logs of like what was being done. And, um, and then the way that they would track like a job going through the production line was like just a giant folder that would see, be like step one. All right. What's, what's happening in this job. And it would be written. And obviously a lot of mistakes happened because of that. <laughs> um, and when we approach these ERP systems, like I remember we were trying to approach like other ERP systems specific for my dad's manufacturing industry. And uh, it, it was just very like expensive, you know, it was like $200,000 just to get started. And then uh, you had this crazy maintenance fee um, that you had to pay. And then everything was on premise too. Right. So anytime you needed an upgrade, you would have to pay for uh, pay for those upgrades as well. So I, it, like my dad, he, he didn't really see the ROI back then. And then um, he heard horror stories from all these like software integrations. So uh, like ERP is so like, yeah, kind of, like give it a bad taste to, to the manufacturing industry. Like, well, it's too, too, a lot, it costs a lot on prem. It's, it's horror stories are connected to it. So then you're like, yeah. all right, there's got to be a better way to do this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's initially like, you know, what I was thinking, right? Because um, what an ERP tries to do, at least in the manufacturing industry, is like they're trying to do everything. They're trying to optimize every part of the digitization uh, workflow. But and it, it's just very hard to do that with one software. That's why I think there's uh, been an increase in verticalization of software, uh, specifically about certain use cases. You know, like you have maintenance, people want to focus just on like maintenance um, uh, software. You have like um, production, like MES is like MES is a manufacturing execution system. And what that means, it's, it's just focusing on the production side. And now like, you know, what I'm creating is more about the quality and safety because that's like another part, like an ERP does have these components, but you know, it, it's like, if you're trying to build everything, uh, nothing really is the, 
like you know, best of breed. Yeah, um, it may leave it may, may leave you wanting more if it's just a small component of a much larger system. So you you want yeah. to really hone in and build just a software around safety and processes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, like I read the story about this one steel manufacturer called uh, Alcoa, and um, what they did uh, back in the eighties was uh, they only optimized for one thing, and when once they optimized for that one thing. Um, uh, they ended up tripling or quadrupling their their market value. And Alcoa is like a like a public steel manufacturer. And um, uh, the new CEO came in and he said, "All right, I just want to focus on one thing, which is safety, and, and that's it." And they just focus, they just optimize for safety, nothing else, because they have the highest entry rate um, uh, above like normal uh, in their industry. And he came in, and then within um, like five to six years. Uh, they became a multi-billion dollar company because they just focused on safety because um, focusing on the safety aspect of it had compounding uh, compounding effects. Like people were more careful about how they did things. So quality increased and because quality increased, right? Like the, repu- the reputation increased and, you know, um, more people came to them. So it, it was just like a micro change. Um, you're, you're, you you fully that. believe that, that, that safety is like the foundation of a successful business. If you put safety first, the quality yeah. and the business outcomes will follow. It, exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, it, it, like there's a, there's this phrase that a lot of, um, people use in manufacturing, like continuous improvement, but what continuous improvement is, is small changes make, um, big results. And a lot of people think they have to over, like over architect the workflow and do the things. But honestly, it's like focusing on the area of highest opportunity or lowest hanging fruit, and then working from there and doing experiments to, to optimize other areas. But if you try to, like what an ERP is doing, it's they're trying to do everything at once and optimizing the whole workflow, which like makes it cumbersome. And, you know, you're just going to, uh, it just leads to failure after that. So you you about two two years in three years in 2018, 2019 is when when you when you started work cloud you actually were YC Combinator went 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 through that um, yeah Y Combinator but how how did it like the begin the antithesis you, you immediately see a reson a resonation with with manufacturing um, saying wow we this is what we need or has it been a more of a a slower adoption because of the the history of ERPs and like oh technology do we really want this in manufacturing. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that's like, one of the biggest things about, like, I, I know why it's, uh, you know, there hasn't been as much software because there is some sort of reluctance for manufacturers to adopt software. And uh, you, you're completely right on uh, on that statement. Uh, ERPs, um, they, they sort of scarred manufacturing companies. Like, even today when I'm doing demos or sales calls, I'm still hearing like, oh, you know, what, what's the on-premise maintenance fees? What, what's going I was like, no, we're not on-premise. And like, they're still, a lot of them are still afraid of cloud, but they don't realize they use cloud every day too. Right. And like their everyday life. And, um, and I honestly think like in the nineties, um, a lot of people in the nineties are still working in the same manufacturing companies. Um, at least from like my experience and there's long tenures with manufacturers, like the average age of a manufacturer is 56 years old. Right. So they've been working like, um, in that industry for a long time. And so much has changed within that industry. And in terms of technology, since they first get, got started in there. And I, I think in the 90s, they were very receptive to software. And that's where the ERPs came in and totally ruined um, their perception of software. But it is getting better, especially, I think, after COVID, right? Like um, the pandemic, I think uh, they, they were still reluctant during during the pandemic. But now, like, they see the value of how software could actually, um, you know, streamline a lot of the processes, especially if not all the personnel are, are there. And there are other crises going on in manufacturing, such as, uh, you know, um, skills gaps, people, uh, negative rate of replacement um, from people retiring. And I, I think um, they're beginning to know that uh, they're beginning to realize, like, you know, software will help uh, streamline, like, at least a tribal knowledge. So we could operate with less people um, when things are more systemized. And, and that's why I think the adoption curve is actually increasing. Um, and you just have to give them a specific use case. I think that's like the biggest thing is if you, if you're trying to optimize everything, cause I remember in the beginning when I first started the software, um, we were trying to optimize their production, trying to optimize, like almost kind of replacing the ERP, just making it user-friendly. And then we ended up uh, iterating, um, and iterating until we got to like the simplest thing, which is like, how do I optimize quality and safety? And that's what we're focused on today. That's a powerful component of realizing to focus on one 
Grandler, let's just get this uh, working really well in safety. Help me understand in a use case, like it, it in play, how does your platform, how does your tech work? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I guess the simplest thing is like what we try to introduce them to is just replacing their like Excel, PDFs and other forms that they're filling out already. And um, like their existing process right now is to do, like let's say they want to do a, like a quality visual inspection. I have this engine and I have to make sure this engine checks up, uh, you know, um, I have to make sure that all like it, it's, it's non it's conforming um, to what it's considered normal. Right. So I'm going manually on like a piece of paper saying, all right, check, check, check. All right. It's on to the next one. Right. Um, and what that leads to is a compounding cost of quality issues, right? Like you might miss a check or, you know, things might not, not get escalated because they'll write defect, but no one will see that defect on that piece of paper until like the end of the line because <laughs> it's not getting escalated on time. So what our software is doing, at least like um, in the, like, I guess like the most simplest use case is digitizing those forms and making it a little bit more automated. So we're adding a lot of more um, uh, automation workflows. So like, let's say if something is notified as um, non-conforming, like they're, they're, they're inspecting an engine, right? And something like goes wrong with the engine instead of someone having to look at it like later on or them having to look for a supervisor, everything is escalated um, in the appropriate time to actually address that issue before it goes uh, uh, further along in the supply chain. So basically someone there is standing before this engine like, yeah, this doesn't look right. There's a problem. They, they basically check off something, a button that sends off an automation that notifies the right person like, hey, this needs to be looked at. And then they can come over while that person can move on and continue their job. Yeah, yeah. And, and like what we're working on right now is um, we're, we're trying to e even make it easier for like the technician or operator or engineer um, to visually check it. Instead of just relying on their eyes, we're actually incorporating more camera technology to automatically identify it. So we'll, we'll run like a machine a learning algorithm on like what, what is considered, uh, you know, a good engine with no defects versus a, a bad engine. And then um, instead of them having to actually visually check it just themselves, they could take a picture of it and our system will tell them like what's wrong with that particular engine. Interesting. And is that, is that live today where they just basically take a picture with their phone and then it gets loaded into the app? Like how, what's that process look like? Yes. So I wouldn't say that's live today. That's something that we are working on because we're trying to, um, we're, like it's, I would say that's like the next edition. We are doing a pilot, a few pilot programs for, with enterprises on that particular feature. Um, and that's something that, you know, we wanted to take it to the next level, like what would make it easier for someone to inspect something or to actually control their quality um, uh, preemptively and not have to rely on like human error, you know, it, and it, it, it's more of an augmentation than like a replacement. It kind of actually makes me think of how um, um, vision uh, computer vision is being used in radiology with humans being able to say, okay, what's, what's yeah. wrong with, with this issue? Why not apply it to the same in manufacturing? Uh, you still have a person that can look at it and, and make the assessment, but a computer can go through it and, and maybe in fine details that a human might miss. Yeah, it, it, exactly. That's, that's a great analogy. And um, that's sort of our thought process too, right? Like um, a lot of people, like they, they want to know like how can software not just like 10 X their workflow, how, how can they hundred X it, right? Where, um, you know, things are really being mistake proof. And that, that's what we're trying to do. That's like, that's why we put mistake proof your operations because, um, you know, we're, we want to make sure that we give them the tools to completely, uh, you know, streamline and mistake proof that operation. So let me, let me take us in, in a direction here, if I may. Yeah. We're talking about automation and technology. We're, we're getting to an era of where technology really is automating almost everything. And so the yeah. question can be asked, well, won't an entire manufacturing floor just be completely automated? Like what, where, where do you see then the, the balance of, of both automation and, and, and humans come into play? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, I, I think right now, like we're probably not at the area where, uh, you know, robots and everything is, is uh, completely replacing the human. Um, I think, the level of skill is is just needed. Um, I, I think there's a, a higher need for people with more uh, more technical skill sets, and like that's what's uh, increasing. Um, and I, I think like you know like very manual, repetitive tasks will be automated, but things that require critical thinking and continuous improvement won't be replaced by robots. They'll be replaced by people who have um, you know more skill sets to actually do their job. And 
it, it is very contentious, especially in manufacturing. Uh, you know, there, there's like, everyone's afraid that a robot's going to replace their job. And, you know, it, it is going to happen. I, I wouldn't say any time like within the next five years, but it's going to happen uh, like, like in the next decade or two. But you already mentioned that there's a negative rate of replacement in manufacturing already. So it actually, yeah. if any, we actually need more automation in order to keep the yeah. same status quo. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, exactly. I, I was reading a story um, in um, Japan. Uh, a, a huge portion of the Japan's population is elderly. And um, there, uh, there's a labor shortage in terms of retail work. And how they compensated for that is everywhere in Japan, you'll see a vending machine. Um, like a vending machine for food, a vending machine for like, you know, just like picking up appliances. And that's already starting a trend. Like when there is a negative re replacement, if there's not enough um, like labor to uh, uh, to like replace people in jobs, then you're going to have to resort, resort to automation. That's going to happen right now. Um, eventually, that's why I said it's, it's going to happen in the next like decade or two. But I would still say that there is still a need for um, critical thinking because like robots and machines and like you know, computers are not at the level where they could have like supreme critical thinking as a human just yet. Well, an another shift to, uh, to this conversation when it comes to manufacturing, which is this gets, I don't really want to go that political, but will manufacturing yeah. <laughs> go overseas? I mean, like, will, will manufacturing still? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Have you seen? Yeah, I mean, um, some industries, it makes sense to have overseas, right? Um, there is like a concept called nearshoring where, um, people are operating in Mexico and like the cost of labor is obviously higher, but um, even like in China, people are not even manufacturing in China as much anymore for certain areas because um, uh, the China's middle class is increasing and their wages are going up. And like, I know uh, the Chinese government's like uh, sort of trying to subsidize it where, um, you know, people can still have a cheap cost of living um, where the labor, uh, like they're trying to, uh, you know, manage the market, but eventually, you know, gonna catch the economy is going to grow over there. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's one of the fastest growing economies right now. And um, the, the manufacturers just get more expensive there because of labor costs. Um, so now you have like Vietnam and um, other industries, I would say like clothing, textiles, um, a lot of these types of industries are um, being outsourced, but things that, um, you know, like, for instance, uh, we focus a lot on automotive parts manufacturers and a lot of parts do get manufactured overseas. Um, but there are some components that people want, like more quality engineering, right? Um, so that you have like a lot of European based ones, a lot of uh, US based ones, like um, Tesla does all their in-house manufacturing themselves, but then, and then they want to source American parts. And there's some regulations uh, that needed to make sure that they're only sourcing American parts. Like um, there's a few companies like Mitsubishi, um, Fort Warner, they have to, because of regulation, they have to stay in the United States or they have to source from the United States. So. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Now, now, as far as as um, this technology uh, growth and, and the way people are, are using it, you, we've already talked a little bit about the slower adoption uh, in in the manufacturing space. But yeah, but it's, it's changing. But if anything, but then the pandemic has been an accelerant of our area. We got to we got to bring bring more tech in into it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, overall, the future. What can you paint? Um, kind of what you're excited about the roadmap and end of of where everything is heading of mm -hmm. with being able to use technology in, in, in helping with processes and keeping people safe in manufacturing. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's going to be very, like, I remember, I'm already seeing, seeing it with HoloLens. Um, I feel like uh, that's like, um, it, it's just a hard hat with um, like AR and VR technology. Um, I, I feel like it's going to be more, like bio related or ergonomic related. Like um, I was reading how Tesla was able to increase their safety. And um, one of the biggest improvements is they visualize like what their workers were doing. And they realized like the, the, the reason why uh, the rate of injury was increasing is because the ergonomics. Um, so I feel like it's going to be a lot of like biotech or um, body, body tech that's going to help with safety and quality. And even like a lot of the stuff in manufacturing, it's going to be like an extension of their body um, uh, with technology. And that, that's how I see it going is more bio biotech and ergonomic related, like exoskeletons and stuff like that. Do you have 
plans of integrations with more wearables and other content to be able to pull in? Or is it, or, or do you see as far as a roadmap for, for, for you guys is more of just, it, it's a, a workforce enabler, meaning they're able to automate the, the specific tasks or do you see growing into uh, more integrations? Uh, I, I see us growing into more integrations, like, because one thing we want to do is we want to empower workers, not necessarily replace them. Um, so I, I like to say like our system is more augmenting what the, what they can do. It's almost a- adding like superpowers to what they could already do. And it makes them look better too. And that's what we want to do. We want to make them look better. And the more tech that we could augment their abilities and make it more seamless, not like in- intrusive, um, the, the better, I think, uh, you know, like society will be, at least in manufacturing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, just for, just for fun, if you could wave a magic wand and have mm-hmm. any futuristic technology uh, come into existence right now, uh, what would you have? Teleportation, 100%. Like, I, I even had an idea, like um, my company would be called Quantum for Quantum Entanglement because of teleportation because it has so many use cases. It'd probably destroy a lot of industries if it was introduced today, right? Um, like, like, but I was thinking about like, there's so many use cases for teleportation, like, and um, like we wouldn't have a resource constraint because we'd be able to teleport to any part of the universe and uh, like even get resources from er- anywhere. Uh, like we have unlimited resources at that point, right? And I, I think it would change our society, like even um, like culturally, uh, you know, technologically, um, you know, it, it'd be a lot more prosperous if we had that one technology. So that's, that's one I, I would I'd love to have. Teleportation. Yeah. Beam me up, Scotty. I, I think everyone can uh, <laughs> yeah. appreciate that one for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much Arjun, for sharing your, your journey that you've been on in many ways. Yeah. It's just beginning, but it painting yeah. a, a future of a safer work uh, place using technology augments workers to be able to be more efficient and safe at the same time. Uh, for those that, that want to learn more, you should go over to workclout.com. So that's work c l o u t dot com and it looks like you can book a demo kind of like explore is that a good first step for people to take yeah yeah that's a that's an excellent first step to book a demo and you might even be uh in contact with me so direct I'm happy to talk to you. Yeah. directly with arjun well thank you again for your time man it's good to have you on and we'll see you all on the next episode of uptech report Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know. 